So when you're talking about uh, processing and integrating uh, SACS data collected in high throughput, um, you know, uh, yesterday I talked about this setup where we have 96 well plates, we're collecting a ton of data, um, and that presents a challenge um, for processing the data because, um, and we've relied heavily on uh, farming the data processing out to users like Kevin and Chris, um, who have, you know, uh, handled their data and, and processed it. It's not like uh, one sample or three samples like you get from, you know, SEC where, you know, it's a tractable amount and you can you know, quickly get your SACS results and then focus on the biology. If you've got a 96 well plate of results, um, you know, it's impossible for Beamline staff to go through that uh, on their own by hand. Uh, so we were working, you know, relying on users to do that. Um, and now we're collecting at a rate that even for users, it's becoming more and more challenging. So it not only presents a processing challenge, but uh, also looking at the data together. I'm trying to advance my slide. And it's having fun with me. Side. All right, there we go. Uh, let me skip that slide. All right, so I'm just gonna, besides uh, the wonderful uh, studies that uh, Kevin and Chris just talked about in terms of high throughput analysis, um, I'm just gonna highlight three other examples that were published this year. So uh, this was a study on nano disks, and I'm just describing the kinds of studies that you might think about doing with high throughput instead of, you know, or in complement to SEC SACs. Um, you know, so this was a study of looking at nano disks and enriching the amount of a different type of lipid uh, into the nano disks and seeing how that influenced nano disk structure. So you can see if you have 100% uh, POPG, it's a kind of a flat narrow structure. As you introduce POPG, you start getting fatter and fatter and more elliptical uh, nano disks. So you can imagine that being useful for certain membrane proteins and, and why certain mixtures work for some mem membrane proteins and not for others. But again, it's a combinatorial issue. Uh, another example was looking at um, post-translational modifications. So there's a protein gamma crystalline in your cornea um, that uh, is at 400 mix per mil and uh, is transparent, but over time it gets apparently uh, uh, deaminated. And as it becomes deaminated, it be, um, starts to enter an aggregation prone state, which causes cataracts. So you know, 400 mg per mil is not common. So uh, this group was looking at treatments of alpha crystalline as you progressively deaminate the protein and showing that um, in solution, different deamination treatments uh, introduce the structure factor. So sometimes you would get repulsion between gamma crystallines and sometimes you'd get this aggregation that was uh, not helpful. Um, another example and one that, uh, you know, generally hits tons of home runs is uh, Dave Baker's lab. I mean, they, they publish science papers a lot. Uh, that utilize a lot of the SACS beamline, uh, the high throughput. So in this particular study that was just published, they invented, oh, it advanced without me telling so. Um, they um, created basically the wheel and axle for proteins. There aren't many examples in, in biology. There's you know some ATP, the ATP CAs um, in membranes, but, and maybe some, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, little uh, pili that will rotate, but uh, you know they're very rare to have wheels. Uh, and so the Baker Lab, you know, was looking at engineering different types of pro you know examples. Uh, you know, they had to come up with something that assembles that didn't slip off once it's assembled, and that was free rotating. And they created a whole bunch of these guys, uh, which we hope will be used for some purposes. Uh, but in order to validate the structures, what you see is all the SACS data on the right-hand side, the red versus black, uh, and they're just using it to confirm that the design structure 
and you know just the pieces and the assembly um, were were made. So using it's a very simple way of using sacks, and they've got like a protein synthesis team that's amazing. Um, and of course, their proteins are are super stable. So um, this is the kind of plates that we would get for different types of um, high throughput experiments. Uh, if you're doing a construct screen like that Baker Lab, or um, like Kevin was talking about, you know, and you're doing it in the same buffer, uh, where pink, you know, uh, sorry, orange is buffer, and then you have your three concentrations that you'd measure. So this would be a plate you could set up for um, measuring that. You could double book your buffer on either end. Um, so that would be high, low, high concentrations. Uh, we've been <clears throat> uh, using the system for drug screening, pH and salt screening. And there you have one protein, same protein, same concentration, but you're varying the buffer. And again, we really recommend collecting buffer on either side of the sample, just to make sure that you know the error and subtraction isn't um, gone off. Um, so you know you put buffers on either side, and then you have your drug mixture or your pH and salt screen somewhere in there. All right. So here are some controls in uh, conducting a high throughput SAC study. Um, before you run a control, uh, be, before you send a full plate of samples, run some control samples first in high throughput. Um, it's a lot of protein. So if you're talking five mg per mil, 30 microliters per sample, 48 wells a sample, you know, you're into the one and a half milliliters of that or seven mg of protein. That's a lot of protein. And not a lot of you belong to that club, um, probably, where you can produce, you know, seven mg of, of protein. Um, so make sure you've done your uh, due diligence, run your control sample. Um, you wanna check for concentration dependence. For sure, run an SEC stack sample also. Uh, you know, you, you, the high throughput is gonna have, not gonna take care of your heterogeneities, right? Um, so you're gonna be running, if it's not a pure peak, knowing that there's heterogeneities in the sample if you have a SEC. Maybe it's a pure peak and, and you don't have to worry about it, but no, before you, before you run it. I would include a control sample on every plate you send. So that control sample might be, you know, your wild type protein every time. And, you know, if you're super concerned about it, you could put it in each corner, you know, an A2, you know, buffer sample, A2 would be wild type, and maybe H12, H11 would be your other wild type. Run a control on each, every plate. Um, if you're doing drug screening, a lot of people will do it with DMSO um, just to solubilize the uh, drugs. Um, but DMSO also can change the conformation of macromolecules on its own. So make sure you do it, whatever you're using to solubilize your protein, that you've done a DMSO screen, you know, and don't just compare without, because we want to make sure that what we're studying is not DMSO effects. Um, Please check for solubility, particularly with drugs. Um, sometimes, you know, the drugs, even with DMSO, will come out of solution. Uh, you'll, and also maybe you've done an extreme pH, you know, a, a pH of one, and that aggregate your protein. So that's going to introduce some particulate matter um, and that might, you know, drift in and out of the beam as we collect. Might cause some clogged needles. You might, you know, at one point introduce some crud on the needle window that just sticks for the rest of the experiment. So at least be very aware of the solubility issues that you have. And if you know that there are solubility issues, please also let the beamline scientists know that there might be solubility issues uh, that we should look out for. Um, there are some things that we're doing to help uh, those of you who are not in the seven milligrams of protein club. Um, so uh, Brandon's been working on uh, very low volume needles. So uh, Brandon claims that this uh, six microliter in a well uh, needle works. It picks up four microliters. Currently we're asking for 30 microliters. And we're picking up 15. So this six microliter uh, reduction is a five fold drop. So that puts you down to the one milligram of protein needed per plate kind of and I bet more of you belong to that club than the other one. Um, so if we get this to work, I think it's gonna be 
uh, we're going to have a lot more uh, projects. It's it's a big, you know, a five-fold drop in uh, requirements is a big drop. Um, so, by, you know, a lot more projects will come. Uh, we're also uh, working on quick exchange needles. So ones that uh, currently, you know, if we're running for a week, we'll probably have two needles for that week and maybe have eight users or 10 users or something like that. So if we could quickly exchange uh, needles, maybe per project, or you know, at least someone's sending us some crud in the sample, we can quickly uh, get it, get out of it. It just uh, allows for um, us to run more plates during the available time. Um, another thing that we're adding or have added, um, but not fully implemented is a UV uh, on the side. So you can imagine adding in uh, series with the collection, you go over the x-ray beam, you collect your SACS data, and you go over to the UV area and collect the UV sample. Um, so that's um, something that's particularly good for uh, checking proteins with uh, redox state issues or other things. So, you know, this is implemented. Um, we're now adding multiple plates on the deck, and we also have a DLS plate reader. So one thing that we could pretty easily do is pull up from your plate, the plate that you sent, and then drop down into a DLS plate so that you could both get your SACS data and your DLS data and your UV data, I mean, in principle. Um, so with the way that we're collecting data with this needle, we can deliver it to many different instruments that can accept that kind of thing. So if you have another technique, that's interesting uh, to add. And again, I'm, you know, listening to the last couple talks, you know, circular dichroism came into mind, um, you know, or um, maybe some cross-linking, um, you know, we might be able to apply those, but those are sort of long-term goals. Uh, and just to say that, you know, we're using this uh, plate reader, uh, no, sorry, this uh, UV cell um, so that, um, you know, uh, we can look at carryover issues. So we can add something with color like blue dye into the needle, you know, look at the UV trace and then, you know, look at the residual. Um, this in particular was comparing uh, first blue dye then directly into water without a wash and just seeing how much residual dye there is. So we're using this, uh, this uh, system a little bit now. Uh, I don't know that this movie will play. We will see. Um, and I may have to drag over and we'll see if I get kicked off the internet for doing this. And my internet is slow. So um, what I want you to see is that um, at the very top of the needle there, you can see uh, the liquid level going up and down. So what you're seeing there is uh, oscillation of sample during collection. Uh, so what we're hoping is that that will greatly reduce, if not eliminate, uh, radiation damage for most samples. And we've applied this, you know, it works really, really well for everything we've tested, but uh, occasionally we get a sample, and, and again, maybe Kevin was a victim of this, um, where, you know, you get a bubble or a low density um, amount of liquid in there, and if you look at the transmitted X-ray beam, you know the plug of sample comes in and out, and the bubble comes in and out as well, right? So you get these oscillations during your uh, collection. So you know this is something we wouldn't have added to the pipeline if it didn't work in our hands. But if you got something pretty sticky, or you know things aren't quite right, um, you might fall victim to some of this. So look out for it. Let me move this out of the way. All right, so um, I'm try to advance here. Let's see if I fall into the trap. Okay, great. Um, so Chris uh, already talked about efforts to reduce the challenge in processing data. So if you're getting 48 samples in a plate and you've sent us three plates, you know that's a lot of data to crunch through. Probably too much. Uh, you know, for, I mean, that's going to take you maybe a month. <laughs> so what we would like to do is we would like to help uh, process the data for you. So um, I'm going to go through the um, uh, frame slice tool in a second. 
but um, you know, this is how the rate of gyration changes as the number of frames. So that's a really good indicator. And these are two different samples and how that uh, behaves. So um, you know, we have tools, Chris has developed the tool, other people are developing tool and we're trying to add that to the pipeline so that uh, you get whether your buffer one subtraction agree with your buffer two subtraction, whether it's aggregated or not, uh, whether what the RG is, and then how many frames you can take. So the number of files that the RG region stayed the same, given buffer one, given buffer two, and the average. So you know um, these kinds of things. So um, yeah. So with that, I'll, I'll pause here for a second. And I was going to go into a practicum. Uh, Mikhail, how much time do I have again? Uh, Catherine? Sorry, I uh, hang on. Yeah. 45 minutes, I think, but let me check. Uh, that was probably the whole talk. But anyway, uh, are there questions I was going to jump into, uh, uh, you know, using the frame slice? All right. So let me, uh, let's see. Stop share here. And now I'm going to share over here of uh, results um, here. And you should be able to download those to your own terminal through SS, well, R RCP or whatever tool that you use to pull data down. Um, so I've done that already. I want to escape out of presentation mode. Yeah, there we go. Uh, workshop. So I've pulled data down. So avgraphs. Uh, so uh, the avgraphs file contains a summary of the data, and um, you know you can scan through this. Um, you know, uh, this is your buffer one, buffer two comparison gives you a sense of how much radiation damage you have and you know you can open it in whatever way you want and just kind of scream through that. Um, sorry, I'm probably moving faster than Zoom can handle it. To get a sense of that, uh, let's see, I'm going to close that and Yeah, and, and the set I'm going to analyze here is going to be a, a GFP set where I'm varying uh, which salt is in, um, you know, from cesium chloride to lithium chloride and, you know, the concentration. And this is for examining the hydration layer. So I'm going to quickly just kind of uh, go through that. So this is the G GFP. It's a very uh, strongly charged one. Uh, and uh, looking at that plate. I'm going to pick something pretty, uh, to begin with, uh, pretty um, standard. So let's look at the 100 millimolar sodium chloride. That would be the, what you typically send, you know, a typical concentration of sodium chloride. So that's in C2, 3, and 4. Um, that's going to be particularly nice. Uh, let's see. I want to look at this folder. So I'm going to look at the results, the subtractive results, and I want to look at C3, and you know, you've got your buffer one subtracted from the sample, your buffer two subtracted from the sample, and the average. You should be able to go to our beam line. It has all our web applications. So you can go to web applications and you can go through the frame slice tool. And then you should be able to drag and drop, you know, the buffer one in here. And that should load. And um, you should be able to, so what you're seeing here is the very first frame collected, the all 33 frames analyzed together, and you should be able to see whether there's radiation damage. And you can look, and you, we separated this into three regions. So you can look at the Gunier region and just see how many frames you can include before radiation damage occurs. And um, you know, there's a slight amount of radiation damage in this sample. So you can see as I'm increasing the uh, um, number of frames, uh, the uh, teal curve, which is seven frames uh, 
average together has drifted a little bit away from the very first frame, but certainly below the um, average, all of them average together. So there's some tiny bit of radiation damage here. You probably wouldn't have noticed it. Um, and it probably doesn't make a huge amount of difference in terms of the analysis. You know, it's probably a half angstrom difference in radius of gyration. But here I'm examining the same protein just in different salts. And I'm really looking at the hydration layer and whether, you know, cesium comes on to the, the surface of the protein or not. So these are exactly the things that I really want to pay attention to. So these half angstrom distances, uh, differences are important. Um, so I can, uh, you know, so basically that's what you're looking for. Um, in the data set, we've already started um, had, including a file here, an RG analysis results file. It's in the RG stats and it's not particularly uh, use reader friendly like, um, see, I'm trying to open with, I might have to click on it and open with notepad. I used to have a version that was HTML friendly like the other screen, but um, uh, somebody updated Python and that uh, broke. But uh, so looking at uh, C3 buffer, no, C2 buffer one, uh, it's saying that you can use the first 11 frames before the radius duration changes significantly. So, and that was kind of where, where we were at. I was, I was going at seven, then like somewhere around there is where the noise from the um, first frame is high enough that you can accept up to 11 frames and still be within the noise of the first. So it's doing some kind of, uh, not some kind, it's, I wrote the code, so I know exactly what it's doing, um, but it's doing uh, an analysis of the files. So again, you would, you would do this for um, all of them. So that's just gives you a flavor uh, you would download that and you would um, then, uh, uh, you know, compare buffer one and buffer two against each other to make sure they agree uh, to, and, and pick one of those two. Uh, so you again assess those. So that's, that's kind of the workflow of, of processing 30 frames. Again, I'm looking at a whole plate worth of this, right? So it, it takes some time. Uh, and, and as those of you who have done this, uh, no, it can be really uh, numbing after, with all the data that we're producing. So again, that's why we're trying to process, uh, create automated scripts uh, for it. Uh, let's see. I think that's all I wanted to do there with that. Um, go back to my talk here. And mention uh, that, uh, let's, yeah, I guess I'll just go this way. So we have an, a, a new repository for correlated data sets like the ones that we're generating. This is called Simple Scattering. Um, and it is meant to be not only a repository for correlated scattering data sets, but also a place where we're gonna be starting to store all of your SEC SACS data sets, or we're thinking about it, we're, 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 we're actually uh, prototyping it now. It may work, uh, I'm hopeful it'll work, uh, but uh, we're gonna ask, for community involvement in helping us develop that further. So going to the uh, web apps, going to SAC sample server, blah, blah, blah. there you go. Uh, nope, not sample server. <laughs> That's where you deposit your spreadsheets. Uh, I want, uh, sorry, it's underneath the zoom bar. Simple stacks. There we go. And I can type in here, you know, GFP. And uh, this is a uh, deposited data set. Uh, it has a code associated, much like a PDB code when it was created. Um, and this is green fluorescent protein supercharged with mining 29 with the chloride salts. Uh, and I deposited this and I have a description and, you know, where it would be published and the design. Uh, we're adding uh, information about um, the sequence and uh, the source of the material. Uh, but uh, we would like you guys to deposit your high throughput data sets here. Uh, we think that tools are very necessary to develop for analyzing such correlated data sets. 
uh, I think, uh, you know, people who are developing the SEC SACS code would only benefit from having um, data sets that are SEC SACS. So if I go to all data sets here, you know, there's some uh, SEC SACS data sets here, and this is the full spectrum. Uh, so for tool building, this is what we're opening for. So I'm going to go to GSP, view it. I'm going to pull this guy down. All right, and I'm going to show him folder. So this is the full data set. Uh, I'm going to open it to zip file. Uh, let's see, extract all, extract. And inside are the data sets uh, of, of, of the data. Um, so that's deposited there. Um, yeah, and I'm gonna now talk about uh, using uh, similarity maps to analyze such data, okay? So uh, also at the Beamline are uh, SACS uh, similarity maps here. So I'm gonna illustrate what this is. Uh, there's a tutorial in here um, by using an example data set uh, that's available there. So this is um, a cage and uh, this is theoretical data of this cage in multiple confirmations uh, going from a open state like the one shown here to a closed state. So it's a linear morph between the two. And you can pull that down using that set, that morph, that zip there. And then you can drag and drop. Uh, let's see, I want to look at not the downloads, because that's what I just pulled up. Uh, workshop, and uh, it's not there. So I may, let's see, I must have put it down, pulled it down on downloads just a second ago. Oh, yeah. So here's the morph. So uh, the way that I've deposited that data set uh, was in a random order. So um, the second, um, frame parts, that is the steps in the morph. But I've randomized them here so that when you pull them up, they'd be named. And if you label them alphabetically, it's going to um, be randomized. So I'm going to dump all these SACS profiles into the SACS similarity map. Um, so this, um, what this thing does is it compares each cell is a comparison of two SACS profiles. So if I click on this one, um, these are the two scattering profiles that are compared. Um, so this is randomized frame order zero, zero against randomized frame zero, one. These are actually step two in the morph and step 16 in the morph. Um, so it's comparing how similar these two curves are to one another. Uh, the number reported here is the difference in raised duration. So you can, um, uh, show RGs and it'll show all the differences in the radius of duration of all of these frames. Um, because it's randomized, you know, you're going to have to sort through it, but there is a clustering function. You can cluster it and it'll cluster it by based on how similar or the reddest things will appear close together and the ones that are far apart will appear far apart. I'm going to hit cluster here. And what you should see is that based on how similar the SACS profiles are to one another, it's self-organized by frame number. So the steps in the morph, right? So frame zero, the very start of the morph, which is the open cage, is now right next to the first step. So it's using, it, it doesn't know anything about the structure. All it has is a SACS curve to work with, right? So it's just using how similar the, the SACS curve is and therefore, defining how similar the structure is, it's an inferred thing, right? And so it pretty much gets it all right. Uh, I guess 19 and 20 are pretty flipped. I can switch them over if I want to by hand, but that, that's about right. So um, that works. Um, there's another option for visualizing such a data set, and that's using this force plot option. And it's pretty trippy, um, so I apologize for it. But um, basically what happens is each of the SACS curves gets displayed as a node. And the size of the node is going to be proportional to the raised duration. So um, the closed cage is over here, 
and it just and it uh, has a force that's um, correlated to how similar they are. So things that are very close in similarity will be displayed next to each other, and it'll go around. You know, and and you know sometimes when things are very close, there's um, you know some lots of uh, false minima, so you kind of have to shake the structure a bit just to denot things. But um, this again, it, it could be useful to you uh, for analyzing the data. So I'm gonna just go back to my talk and just say, um, this is uh, the steps in the morph that I just talked about. And I've, I've, in the, the example I used 20, this is just 11 steps. These are the Sachs curves from each of these steps. If I drop them in randomly, you know, you get something random, but if I cluster them in a sensible way, in a sensible algorithm, that's what I mean, um, you get something that's pretty meaningful to you. It, it's how similar things are. Um, as was mentioned by Kevin before, um, you, you can do things by chi-squared, and that's, you know, what most people would do. Uh, we've created a different uh, metric for quantifying how similar two curves are. It's called the uh, volatility ratio it basically um, uh, takes the ratio of two curves and sees how volatile it is just like stocks um, and that correlates much better with this uh, the RMSD differences so as you step through this morph it's a linear morph right so the RMSD difference between this structure and this structure should be about the same as between this structure and that structure etc um, and so the V sub R seems to do track much better with RMSD, chi-square just uh, loses all capacity to do so. It's basically a binary measure uh, by the time you get to the third step. So it says yes, similar or no, not similar. So, you know, you, you oscillate between one and then, you know, 10, 15, and it's just not similar anymore. So we really like this visa bar. It's not the end all, there's lots of problems with it, but um, I like to use it for these, this purpose. Um, and so just joining those two tools, you know, simple SACs, you got your uh, correlated data set, you can pull that down. Uh, you can go then to your frame, uh, sorry, similarity tools here. And you can, let me see if I can find that data set now. Uh, workshop, GFP data, GFP data. Uh, look at my results folder. Oh no, wait, this is the original. I want from the website. Sorry, I'm confusing myself here. Let's just do it again. Uh, go to not that one, not that one. I'm looking for, uh, let's just go for straight. Simple sax, GFP, view, pull this down. Show in the folder, extract all, extract. All right, so I've got my salt concentration. I go to similarity map. There you are. Find that window again. Uh, there it is. And I can drag and drop that to assess you know, how similar these curves are. And you can see that one of them didn't pop up. This, there's an X here um, and it's the rubidium chloride and they're still here. It's uh, hidden under the name, but at least, you know, it's uh, well, the X is covering things, but um, hundred millimolar uh, rubidium chloride didn't pull up. So I can look at that file and just see why um, things didn't like it. So I can go to rubidium chloride. Sometimes they won't pop up. And it's usually something with the, uh, you know, some header or something. I don't know about that. Um, anyway, you can examine it. I'm gonna not do it on the fly. Um, let's see, is that, it was at 100 millimolar rubidium chloride. Anyway, here's the list, 500. Anyway, uh, here is the similarity plot. Um, you know, sometimes there's noise in the data. So sometimes you want to, and I just picked the, uh, one that disagreed the most, right? And immediately I can see that that's 500 millimolar cesium chloride and 500 millimolar lithium chloride. So that just says something that those things are very different um, scattering curves. And here are how they're different. And um, 
you know, sometimes uh, the asymmetry here means you just have to clip the data around. You can adjust the Q range here, uh, how many Q spots you want to use. Um, you know, the Q range may vary, but you want to kind of change it so that it's symmetric around the diagonal. Because again, this is comparison of curve one versus two, and this is curve two against one. So it's a symmetric matrix. Uh, but it meant, again, you can pick out what's really, really different. Sometimes you have something like this, where there's one curve like cesium chloride that's really different from everybody else. It's a bright yellow streak across the whole thing. And it would be great if we had a little contrast bar here, but I don't have that. Typically, if I'm trying to develop insight into a data set, I might not load the 500 millimolar again. And it looks like, you know, the 100 millimolar cesium chloride is also a problem, right? So, um, you know, that's that. This has been loaded in, you know, not in a sensible way, but I can shift things around. So, for example, I could take all the lithium chlorides, that's 10 millimolar, uh, 100 millimolar, and uh, 500 millimolar, you know, and pull them down. Because of this big contrast here where this is setting the extreme, these all look very similar. But in fact, when I kind of look at it in detail, um, you know, there are differences here um, that um, it just can't pick up by because of this very extreme one. So I can pull that out and then look at the trends that I'm observing. Again, I'm looking at all the data here all at once. So that's the goal of this tool. I'm gonna go through some examples. Catherine, you said, what time? I didn't pay attention, I was too nervous. Uh, we are 15 minutes over, Greg. Uh, well, I was following what Catherine said, so she gave me uh, till I think 2.30. Um, so examples of what you wanna do, um, you know, this is a protein called mutas beta. It um, interacts with DNA, ATP, ADP. So you can create heat maps uh, based on the analogs that are available to you with and without DNA. You can develop insights into similarities. Um, you know, and, and these are curves that, you know, are quite subtly different from one another. And, you know, if, you know, we measured, I think the maximum concentration I could get this guy up to was like two, three mg per mil uh, before it starts to have problems. So, you know, these subtle differences, you may not be able to pick up in SEC SACs. So I mean, it's, it really is a high throughput project. Um, uh, these, uh, this is uh, this cage again, and we're looking at um, different salts and pHs uh, and throwing all the differences. So this is 10 millimolar sodium chloride, pH six, and this is 500 millimolar sodium chloride, pH eight, looking at this cage um, and plotting all the data. You can see this sort of grid-like pattern here. Uh, so you can examine that. Where this occurs is in pH 10 and 11, pH 10 and 11, pH 10 and 11. These are the big extremes. So you can examine that. We hunted that down, realized that it is because this cage is disassembling and forming uh, trimers. Um, if we look as a, keep it in a happy pH, pH 7, and then look as we increase our um, salt concentration, we can see that as you go to lo low salt, you're closer to a compact cage. This is that sort of movie compact cage. And then as you increase your salt, you're expanding it to the uh, open cage. There's just a gradient of similarity as you go. So salt is a way for opening and closing the cage and pH is a way for you know, disassembly and assembly. Um, so those are an example there. Uh, it's probably too complicated to explain this one, but for engineering, you can use it. You can do, you know, so Baker Lab was doing helix turn helix motifs, um, and they were examining all their constructs. So you can plot, you know, your experimental data on one axis, your calculated data to see if their algorithm was working. Uh, so you should get a diagonal similarity if it is working. So it sort of worked um, in that case. And I think I've run out of time, so I won't go through um, the remaining bit, but. Um, Hopefully you see it's a useful tool and at least a step in the direction. We're analyzing a large number of data sets, whether you've generated them in high throughput or in SEC, um, hopefully it's useful to you. So I'll stop there and, and see if there's questions.